One is Pentecostals, and scholars like Dan McClellan claim that in Mark 10, 17, Christ is denying to be God. But is that what this passage is really saying? Find out on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. One is Pentecostals, that is, Pentecostals that deny the Trinity, and other non-Trinitarians use Mark 10, 17 as a proof text to claim that Jesus denied being God. And in a recent short video, Dan McClellan claimed that this verse has force only if Christ was denying being God. So what we're going to do today is take a look at this passage from Mark 10, 17 to 27, and see what it is really getting at. First, let's read the passage. Quote, And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But at these words his face fell, and he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to them, Then who can be saved? Looking upon them, Jesus said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Okay, so that's the passage. And the passage begins with a wealthy man coming up to Jesus and saying, Good teacher! What shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he's looking for that one thing to get him into heaven. Now, while similar passages paint this event in slightly different terms, for example, Matthew 19, the version in Mark is the one that's most often used by non-Trinitarians. And in this version, the wealthy man states, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus responds in verse 18. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, in his recent short, Does Mark's Jesus Deny Being Good? Dan McClellan claims that this is Jesus denying that he is God. I quote, Jesus' rhetorical question, Why do you call me good? And then his clarification, no one is good but God, would have absolutely no rhetorical force if Jesus was not distinguishing himself from and subordinating himself to God. This is a very clear declaration that Jesus is not God. Quote, the problem here is that McClellan makes a fundamental error in exegesis, which is that he has assumed that the only possibility is that the question is rhetorical in nature. However, 
the question could just as easily be a probative question instead of a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question asked for a purpose other than to attain information, and usually where the answer is assumed within the question itself. A probative question seeks out information. Because the interrogative adverb why lends itself to many possible reasons, it is not exactly a blank denial. And there can be many possible reasons that the wealthy man could answer the question in response. For example, is the wealthy man just using empty flattery? Does the wealthy man have a misplaced sense of goodness? Did he, like Peter, recognize Jesus as the Christ, which happened earlier in the narrative in Mark 8.29? And this is the reason, of course, that Exegetes often compare Mark 10 with Mark 8, because the wealthy man is in many respects the antithesis of Peter. Did the wealthy man somehow recognize Jesus as being divine? This is why the question is probative, because many answers to the question are actually possible even though the wealthy man doesn't answer the question. So even with Jesus saying, quote, no one is good except God alone, end quote, this is not, in the strictest sense, a denial of being good, nor is this a denial of being divinity. What McClellan and others have done through their rhetorical force-only argument is a kind of eisegesis. They have read a kind of meaning into the question, that is, it is rhetorical, to get the meaning they want out of the text, that is, Jesus is not God, without considering the range of potential interpretations and outcomes. For example, if the wealthy man simply claimed that he called Jesus good because Jesus was God, in a similar manner as the Apostle Thomas did in the book of John, then both what the wealthy man said about Jesus being good and what Jesus said about only God being good could both still be true. The trouble is, though, that it would miss the point of the passage, which is not whether Jesus is good or even that he is God in human flesh per John 1.14, but that the wealthy man has a distorted sense of his own goodness. That's what the passage is really about. To frame the passage as Jesus denying being God is to insert an eisegetical understanding of one verse that twists the meaning of the entire passage. Now, to drive his point home, Jesus reiterates a selection of the Decalogue. This is the definition of what it means to be good. Quote, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Verse 19. Christ is chastising the wealthy man. Quote, You know the commandments. You know this already. In other words, you already have the law and the prophets. You should know this stuff cold. Do not murder. Christ spoke that if you have anger against your brother, you are guilty of that commandment. Do not commit adultery. If you look on a woman with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And what does the wealthy man do? He bold-faced lies. He says, quote, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up, end quote, verse 20. Yeah, sure you have, buddy. The fact is that the bar of the law is incredibly high. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even this wealthy man. So, what does Christ do in this situation? 
he tells the wealthy man what it takes, which is an act of faith. Quote, And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lacked. Go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. End quote. So he presents here the young man with an act of faith. Okay, he says he's followed the law. In fact, let's see if he follows it in spirit. Is he doing it in faith? But the wealthy man's response was, quote, At these words, his face fell, and he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The text then tells us, quote, The disciples were amazed at his words, verse 24. Now, the reason why the disciples were amazed isn't exactly revealed in the text, but it probably had something to do with the fact that Christ was able to see right through to the issue, which was the shabbiness of the wealthy man's goodness. The wealthy man had, like everyone else, fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus decides to hammer this home. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24. He tells the disciples, It is difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not just for wealthy men, for everyone. It's difficult. It's not easy. But it's not just hard for the average person to get into heaven. Verse 25. Quote, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Entering the kingdom of heaven through your own righteousness and your own holiness is next to impossible. And it is even more difficult if you love the possessions and wealth of this world. Even if the wealthy man had told the truth about keeping the commandments, he still loved his possessions more than God. And that's what separated him from God, is his love of money. But now, this left the disciples with a problem. Verse 26 says, And they were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? End quote. The disciples are sitting there thinking, If this upstanding, apparently righteous, Wealthy young man cannot be saved. Who can? Quote, Looking upon them, Jesus said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. End quote. Verse 27. Salvation is impossible with men. Salvation comes from God and God alone. And if salvation is from God alone, Psalm 62, verse 1, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, and Revelation 19, verse 1, and Jesus Christ saved the world through the forgiveness of sins on the cross, Matthew 26, 28, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Ephesians 1, 7, and 1 Peter 3, 18, and Christ could forgive sins but no one can forgive sins except God alone, Mark 2, 7, then Jesus Christ could only save the world because salvation is an act of God. So instead of Mark 10, 17 to 27, denying that Jesus was God, it exalts Jesus as God. So anyway... I hope you learned something from this passage. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.